Buenos dias. Good morning. It's uh, great to be here. It's always a great opportunity to share uh, this platform with Pastora Dina and family, my suegra. I'm learning a little bit of Spanish. I'm getting there. Um, but let's go ahead and pray. Um, and then we'll get into it. Father, we thank you, God. You are holy. You are righteous. You are the king. You are the lover of our soul. Father, we just give you honor today. We give you praise today, God. Let our hearts be more like you. Let our mind be focused on the things above and not the things below. Let us become more like you, Father, every day. Bring someone to us that we can share the good news with. Bring us somebody who is need in need of prayer that we can pray with, that we can be a friend with, that we can love them into the kingdom. Father, we pray that we will be used. Show us our purpose. Show us what we're supposed to be doing. And we pray that you equipped us to do it, Lord. We thank you, Father, that we are seated in the heavenly places. We thank you that you have adopted us. We thank you that you have called us to be holy, to be blameless, to live righteous, Lord. We thank you, Father, for all your blessings. And we just worship you in the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's continue. We are reading through the book of Ephesians. We are now in chapter 2. So we finally finished chapter 1 yesterday. And so we're going to continue. We're going to continue reading through the book of Ephesians. So I'm going to just start off and then I'll recap a little bit later. But in chapter 2 verse 1 it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'll stop there. But I wanted to kind of recap so we can see what's going on in the in the in the story that that Paul is telling uh, the disciples, Paul is telling the Christians, and <clears throat> he starts off with saying, "You were once dead in your trespasses," and it's interesting because he's talking about he's continuing his thought. Right? He wants us to understand that chapter two belongs with chapter one. And the reason that I'm saying this is because sometimes we open up the Bible, we don't look at the context, we pick a verse and we start reading. But Paul is saying, and you were dead in your transgressions and your sins, because he's trying to remind us of what he just said. In chapter 1, verse uh, 22, he says, God put all things under Jesus' feet. He gave him the head over all things to the church. So he's saying, remember, this is our identity. All things are under our feet. We have authority. We have rule. The enemy is no longer in control. He's still running things, but he's not in control. We have the authority, but the problem is we think he has the authority. He doesn't have the authority. Jesus has the power of Hades, and Jesus has the power. And so, remember, we were talking yesterday about the fact that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. But Paul wants to remind us, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. You used to walk in that way. You used to walk just like the rest of the world, following the prince and the power of the air. The spirit is now at work in the sense of disobedience. That's why we were doing what we were doing. That's why we were acting how we were acting. So when we meet other people who are not Christians, that's why. They're following these powers, they're following the enemy, they're following the demons, they're following all these different things that are not Christ. But for us, it's different. 
for us, we're no longer following that way. We're no longer going and walking in that way. So for us, um, in verse 3, it says, Among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh. We are no longer living in the passion of our flesh. Whenever I do things and I focus on myself, I get into trouble. Whenever I'm having a, a disagreement with my wife or any other person that I'm talking to, and when I focus on myself, I get into trouble. Um, and what I'm I'm not saying is that we should never focus on ourselves. But what I'm saying is that when I focus on myself as most important, I get into trouble. And what I mean is whenever we're focusing on our lives and we're not looking out for the interests of others, we're not praying for others, we're not, we don't care if they get hurt. We don't care. We just say, well, that's how I am. That's how God made me. That may be how you are. That may be how you were born, but that is not where God wants you to stay. How you were born is not where God wants you to stay. We were born in sin. We were once following the desires of our flesh. You were like that. So when a person says, well, God made me this way, that's not true. We're born in a fallen world. So we live in certain ways that God wants us to change. And that's what he's talking about in here. Next, uh, after we're done with the book of Ephesians, we're going to go to the book of Philippians. And he talks a lot about mindset. I'll say it right now, but we'll go in deeper. He talks about the mindset, the way we think about things, the way we focus on things. What are we focusing on? Are we focusing on ourselves? Are we focusing on how to build our own kingdom? If we look at um, Solomon, he was the, one of the wisest people in all the world that has ever lived. Solomon's problem is that he was building his own kingdom. If you look at the measurements of Solomon's palace versus the temple, Solomon's palace was way bigger, almost two times bigger than the temple. His own, and, and there's a scripture in the Bible, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, it says, you're focusing on your own kingdom while the kingdom of God, while the temple of God is lying in ruins. And what it's saying is that you're focusing on building your ministry, you're focused on building your career, you're focused on building your life, you're focused on building things that revolve around you while God's kingdom is lying in ruins, while God's kingdom is being destroyed, while the people of God are not growing, but they're being hurt. And there's no one helping, there's no one giving, there's no one loving, there's no one teaching, there's no one doing what we're supposed to be doing. Really, what it's saying is that your people, God's people, are suffering while you're prospering and you're focusing on prospering yourself. Again, another um, great story is in the Hebrew Bible in the, in, in the Old Testament was the Golden Age. It's called the Golden Age of, of Israel. It's when they were prospering, when they were doing the best, when all their enemies were at peace with them and they had the most money and riches. The problem is, in this golden age, is when they forgot God the most. They were prospering. They were doing well as a country. But they forgot their first love. The same thing we see happen in America. We started off as a Christian nation. And they wanted to know God. And the people were fleeing um, England because they were not able to worship God freely. If you look up history, uh, you had Catholics killing Protestants and Protestants killing Catholics. And there was a war. If you were not um, the same denomination of the king or queen, then you were going to get killed. And that's what they were doing. So when they came to the United States, initially, one of their reasons, not, not all of their reasons, but one of the reasons was because they wanted to worship God without fear, without worrying about what the government's going to do. They wanted to be able to worship God and they didn't have to um, focus on if I worship Jesus, I'm going to get killed. They wanted to be able to focus God and have the freedom of religion. And their idea of religion was denominations, freedom of denomination. I don't have to worry that because I'm a Protestant, I'm going to get killed by. Um, and again, if you look up history, um, Bloody Mary, she was a queen. The reason they called her Bloody Mary is because she killed so many Protestant Christians in such a short amount of time. So that 
she's not a myth. She's actually a person. Um, so history lesson, all this other information. The reason I bring this up is to say that in America, when we turn to God and we focus on God, Harvard, Yale, all these um, Ivy League schools initially started off with the purpose of we want to train people to minister the gospel. That's why Harvard was started. It was started because they wanted to educate people to minister the gospel. And it prospered. Right? It's still one of the most popular um, schools in all the whole world. But God was left out of the situation. And now, if you go to Harvard, you don't have to believe in God. You don't have to believe in Jesus. You don't have to believe in any of that. And you don't even have to want to tell the world about God. So the, the purpose is no longer there. They're still prospering, but they left, they left God out of the picture. They're following the ways of the world. Just like Paul is saying, you used to be dead in your trespasses. You used to follow the course of the world. And they are now following the course of the world. They went backwards. They were following God. Now they're following the world. America was following God. Now they're following the world. So just because someone is prospering doesn't mean that they are godly. It doesn't mean that they're following God. And we may wonder because those of us who are Christians and may not be prospering saying, God, what's going on? I see the wicked prospering. And in, in Psalms, David was asking the same question. Why do I keep seeing the wicked prosper? And so let's go back and let's focus on what God is saying in here. And what he's saying is that the world is doing that. You were, used to do that. So if we look at the book of Romans, Paul has a similar idea. And he's he's telling the Gentiles, because the Gentiles were saying, hey, look at those sinner Jewish people. They're, they're, um, they're not listening to Jesus. They don't want nothing to do with him. They had him crucified. They're such bad people. And Paul has to remind them, hey, don't forget that you used to be like that. You used to be a sinner too. You were not even part of the family of God. Before, you were not even uh, given the opportunity. If you were to become a Jew, then you were given the opportunity. But you didn't even have the opportunity. So for people that may be thinking, oh man, I'm better than them. Look at those Pharisees sinning. Look at those bad people sinning. And he's saying, look, you were just like them. You did the same thing. They're not doing something that you didn't do. And in verse 8, he says, but God. And if we look throughout the Bible and see those rate those verses, that says, but God, he did something, but God did this, but God so loved the world. Those are important phrases where it's saying something about our nature. It's saying something about our condition. It's saying something about our destiny, but God steps in to change it. Our destiny was that we deserve hell. We deserve to be burning. We deserve to be separate from God, even if we're not burning for eternity, but we're separate from God. We deserve that. But God in his rich mercy, but God being rich in his mercy because of his great love. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And so it's such an important point to understand that. Again, um, I, I compare Christianity and Islam a lot because I'm studying Islam right now. But the idea that in the Quran it says that God doesn't love uh, non-believers. It says that God hates them or Allah hates them. It says that Allah hates the non-believers. And it's only when they start following him that he loves them. It's only when they start serving him that he loves them. But in Christianity, it's different. It says while we were still in our trespasses, while we were still sinning, while we were still sinners, God loved us. And it's, it's, a, it's an important and it's a valuable and it's an invaluable type of love that he has for his creation. And we don't see that in any other religion. We don't see that anywhere else. Because it's not the normal type of love. The love that we're used to is, if you love me, I love you back. If you hate me, I hate you back. If you do me wrong, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to do vengeance. 
we focus on the justice and we focus on vengeance. Oh, you hurt me? All right. Either I'm going to shut you out and never talk to you again, or I'm going to make sure that you pay because I don't want anybody else to hurt me. And this is so different than what we're taught. This is so different than what we see. This is a different type of love than what God has for us. His love for us is different. And in many regards, it doesn't make any sense because it goes against our natural in instincts and inclinations. Our natural sinful nature is to rebel, is to fight back. And God's natural nature is love, true love. Not the fake stuff that you hear about, not the fake stuff that you hear on TV where people say love wins. That's not, that's not the, the true love. Their love is, if you do good for me, I'll do good for you. I only love those who love me. And so we see that Jesus talks about this in, um, I think it's in Matthew chapter 5, where he's, or chapter 6 in the Beatitudes, where he starts talking about this love. He says, I know the way that those religious people are loving people. They love those who love them. But he said, instead, I tell you, love those who hurt you, who persecute you, who falsely accuse you. I want you to love your enemy. I want you to do something different. He says, then by loving your enemy, you're going to show the world that you are children of your father in heaven. This is not something new. It's hard. It's incredibly hard, right? It's incre incredibly hard to love people who are mistreating us and who have hurt us. But this is the type of love that God had for us. And this is the type of love that God wants us to show other people. How do we live blamelessly? How do we live holy? The word holy means separate. The, the word holy means whole, complete. The word holy means completely different. So <clears throat> if we're complete and we're whole, that means we don't lack anything. But most of the time we, we lack things and we're not holy because of what we think other people are going to say about us, what other people are going to do to us. Um, and then we're also not different because we're acting the way the world was. And Paul is saying right here is, look, you are different. You're set apart. You're holy. Act like it. Live like it. Live like it. Don't live like the world. You were living like the world because you were following the world. Now you're a Christian. You live differently. Why? Because this is how God loved you. You were dead in your trespasses, but God was rich in mercy. His great love, he loved us with. He made us alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And I think that's an important part. By grace. I didn't work my way into heaven. I won't work my way into heaven. I can study um, Hebrew. I can study Greek. I can study Aramaic. I can study Latin. I can read the Bible every day for the rest of my life. But that's not why I'm going to heaven. Because those are works. Works are good. But works don't get us to heaven. If we're Christians and we're saved, we will produce good works. But just because we have good works doesn't mean that we're Christian and it doesn't mean that we're saved. A lot of people think of it um, in that way. And so even if you look in the Bible, um, Peter and Paul, it seems that they're saying different things, right? Works, faith without works is dead because it's true. You say you have faith, but the way that we can see you have faith is because your works are going to show up. If you really have faith that Jesus is Lord, your life is going to look different. If you're So basically what he's saying, if you're really a Christian, I'm going to see it because the way you act. I'm going to see it because the way you love others. I'm going to see it because the way that you live. Because there's a lot of people that say they're Christian. I live in Texas. It's the Bible Belt. I, I remember um, I was working at Jiffy Lube at the time, an automotive place. And there was about six other co-workers with me. And it was my first day of work. And um, there was a girl that was working with us. And she asked everyone a question. She said, I'm curious, how many of y'all are Christians? And every single one of us raised our hand. And it was interesting because she was saying, wow, that's so that's so weird that everyone here is a Christian. I'm an atheist. And so she obviously wanted attention and she was trying to start fights and disagreements and things like that. She didn't know her facts. But as I again, that was my first day um, working. 
as I got to know the guys more, I'm like, uh, you're not a Christian. They were talking about girls and they were talking about drugs and they were going to the club still and doing all kinds of stuff. And so I knew at that point that they were not Christians just because they said they were. Just because sometimes they went to church. Just because they had tattoos of Bible verses. That didn't make them a Christian. So just because we say we're Christians doesn't mean we're Christians. And the Bible was not saying that we have to work out. We don't have to work for our salvation. We have to work out our salvation. We have to do like when we're working out at the gym. You you put in reps. You put in the time. And you continue to exercise that salvation. You continue to grow. Is really the point of what he's saying. But also at the same time. We are already in these heavenly places. It says. Um, even when we're dead in our trespasses. He made us alive with him in Christ. Again, the idea that it's in Christ. It's it's with Christ. We're made with Christ. All of these blessings. If we're not in Christ, we're not with Christ. Christ is not in us. Then we don't have these blessings. Just like my co-workers. They were not in Christ. They would go in a church, but they were not in Christ. And that's a big distinction that we have to make. Just because people say that they are Christian doesn't mean that they are in Christ or that Christ is in them. <clears throat> Another thing is that it's not our job to judge them and say, oh, you're not even in Christ. I mean, it is important for us to say, look, is your life um, is your life lining up with the scriptures? Because one big thing that's happening is that they're making us look bad. And when non-Christians and like even the girl that was an atheist saying, hey, you say you're a Christian, look at how you're living. Like, you know what? This guy's not even a Christian. Because if you are a Christian, you're going to bear fruit. But um, again, the way that we help someone, we're supposed to help someone who is struggling. We have to do it in a loving way. Because I've seen, and many of us seen, where people, they won't help you, but they'll rebuke you. They'll rebuke you, they'll, they'll make you feel bad, they'll push you down, they'll still th say things in negative ways. And I always hear a lot of people say that um, Jesus was offensive. They always say, well, Jesus was offensive, so I can talk to people like this. Jesus was offensive, so I can do this and I can do that. Um, and the idea is not, Jesus wasn't a jerk. He was offensive, but he wasn't a jerk about it. And I think um, a lot of Christians want the power and the gifts of the spirit but they need to focus on as well the fruit of the spirit they need to focus on getting the fruit of the spirit because um and this is something that i've i've been saying for i don't even know how many years but we can have the right answer but if we say it in the wrong way we're going to be wrong if we say something in a way because we want to make people feel bad we want to show them how smart we are we want to put them down that's the wrong motive when we correct people, that's not the reason we're correcting people. We're correcting people because we want to help them. And if we say it in a way that's going to bring them down and make them feel worse about themselves or make them hate the church and make them hate Jesus, it's not they don't hate Jesus because um because he was a jerk. They hated Jesus because he was telling them the truth and they didn't want to realize the truth that they are sinners, that they need him, that they can't work their way into heaven. That's the biggest thing, especially with atheists. The biggest thing, the reason why they reject Jesus is not because there's not data, not because there's not a historical background, not because the Bible is miswritten and misinterpreted and changed and all these other things that they say. And not because uh, evolution. The reason that people reject Jesus is because they want to be Lord in their life. They want to be God in in their own life. They want to be the ruler. Of their life. The One of the main reasons. That Christians become Christians. Is because we understand that. Trying to be the leader of our life. Trying to be the ruler of our life. Trying to be all in control. Is one it's hard. But also we made a mess of it. We made a mess of things. We thought we were in control. We thought we had it all together and. Then we find ourselves in a situation of suicide or broken relationships or drug addictions. And we say, man, 
I messed this up. I messed the whole thing up. God had a wonderful plan for my life. I messed it up. How did I mess it up? By thinking I'm in charge. By thinking I know better than God. And so that's, again, that goes back to what the gospel is. The gospel is us realizing I can't work my way into heaven. I can't be good enough. I can't do it on my own. I can't save myself. And that's why we become Christians because we understand that. Non-Christians don't understand that yet. They have to, they, they keep doing things and they, they get hung over and they're throwing up and they're having all these bad experiences. And then they say, well, I don't want to go to church because they're going to judge me. And part of that is true. Part of that is true, right? We judge people without loving people. When you love somebody and they know you love them, when you judge them, it's going to come out a little bit different because they know you care about them. There's a saying that says, I don't care how much you know. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. They want to know that you care about them. And for a lot of people, still, that's not going to be enough, right? You're going to tell them something because you care about them. You're going to tell them something in a caring way, and they're still going to reject you. And at that point, Jesus says, just dust off your feet. Keep walking. Still love them. If they come for advice, if you see them, still love them. But um, don't put all your time into it in the sense that they're going to keep rejecting you because sometimes people are hard-headed. And they're going to have to go through those experiences. But when they cry out, then you, you're there for them. When they cry out, they repent and they say, man, I made a mistake. I'm sorry how, you, how I treated you. I'm sorry for what I said. I'm sorry for who I was when they repent. And you're there for them. Then you, you can create, make disciples. You can walk with them on the journey. All right, so let's get back into um, to it. It says, verse 6. Raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Again, there's that that language with him in him. We are seated in the heavenly places. Again, Paul is telling the, the church at Ephesus and Paul is telling us we are in the heavenly places. We are in the heavenly places. That's where we're sitting. That's where we're seated. It may not feel like it. It may not look like it. But that's the truth. That's God's reality versus our reality. So when we read the scriptures, we're not reading it so we can get good truth to bring into our worldly life, into our normal, natural life. We're trying to dive in to the Bible so that the Bible can be our life. The truth of the Bible, the truth of God will become our reality. We bring heaven to earth. We bring heaven to Bring, um, you know, let the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not just God save me so I can go to heaven. No, God wants us to bring the kingdom of heaven down to earth, to the people that we know. Verse seven, so that in the coming ages, he might show the in immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Again, where is God going to show this, this mercy? He's going to show it to the world. By Jesus dying on the cross. But us who are in Christ. He's going to show us even more. We're going to get to experience this. Not just in heaven. But we can experience it now. The fullness of course is going to be in heaven. Our sinless nature is going to be in heaven. But we're going to experience it now. And the fullness we're going to experience in heaven. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Again, he keeps he keeps trying to hammer it. And the reason he keeps hammering, and if I'm repeating what I said yesterday, if I'm repeating what I said last week, if I'm repeating myself, the reason I'm repeating myself is because Paul is repeating himself because he wants to make it clear. For Jews, Jews were similar to um, Muslims in the sense that um, they did works. They did a lot of good works. So you hear a lot of Jews in the in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament where they talk about their works and they come to him and say Jesus what must I do to be saved right like how how many prayers do I have to do how many um rosaries do I have to do how many how much money do I have to give to the poor so I can get into heaven what must I do to inherit eternal life that's the question that's the thinking for Muslims today 
they have to do enough good works to outweigh the bad works. So if you look, if you think about a scale, a weighing scale, you have the good works that you do on one side and you have the bad works that you do on the other side. And it depends on how many good works that you do. I'm helping people, I'm serving people, I'm giving my money, I'm doing all these good things. But then how many bad works are you doing? Are you lying? Are you cheating? Are you smoking? Are you fornicating? Are you hurting people? Are you lying? What are you doing? And then for them, God weighs these scales. And if it's more good works, then you go to heaven. And if you don't, then you go to hell. And Paul is saying, no, that's not how it works. That's not how it works at all. Again, you can't work yourself into heaven. By grace, you are saved through faith. Faith is believing Jesus is Lord. By believing, he's not, he's not going to leave us stranded. He's not going to leave us hanging. He really did what he said he was going to do. He was really there. He really died for us. Believing what he said he was going to do. Believing that God is good. Even when we don't feel it sometimes. We can't live just on our feelings. Our feelings According to Jeremiah, it says that our heart is the most wicked part of us. Do not be deceived. Your heart, we, we watch movies and they say, oh, just follow your heart. Hollywood says, follow your heart. Follow your passions. Follow your emotions. And the Bible says, no, that's wicked. Like Your heart is, is terribly wicked. Who can, who can help that thing? Thank God he gives us a new heart. But he still doesn't want us to lead with our heart. He doesn't want us to lead everything with our heart because our heart is wicked. We should be led by the Spirit. For by grace you have been saved through faith. When you believe Jesus is Lord, not just Savior. Everybody wants to make Jesus our Savior. The Bible says to make him the Lord of your life. Lord, supreme ruler. Whatever he wants, he gets. He's not a dictator. He's not going to force us, but he wants us to do the desire to better things. When we make him the Lord through faith, you are saved by faith, by um, saved through faith. And it's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. God gives you a gift. When it comes Christmas time or when it comes your birthday, you don't work for that. It's just your birthday. They buy you gifts just because they want to celebrate you. You don't have to say, okay, I worked, I, I gave everybody um, something, I, I did, I cooked for them, I did this. Okay, now can I have my birthday present? No, that's not how it works. You get a gift, not because you deserve it, but just because. We don't deserve this. God gives us it as a gift. Verse 9, not as a result of works. Again, he keeps trying to hammer it in their mind. You don't get to heaven because you worked your way into heaven. It's not a result of of your doing, it's a free gift. It's not a result of works, so that no one can boast. If we can buy our way into heaven, we can boast and say, "Look at what I did! I helped all these charities. I helped all these homeless. I did all these good things. I I did all this stuff, and I'm in heaven." If I can bribe God to get into heaven, then I could boast and I say, "Look at what I did!" And then we would be in heaven and ask, "Oh man, what did you do?" Uh, oh, man, I did all this stuff, this humanitarian support. If that was true, then we don't even need Jesus. If we can buy our way into heaven, then Jesus did not have to die on the cross. And atheists can be in heaven and all these other people can be in heaven. But that's just not the case. It's only in Christ that we're able to go to heaven. It's a gift of God so that no man can boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ. Again, in Christ. He wants us to know that this is not just... Um, we're just created, not just everybody, but those who are saved, those who believe Jesus died for us. We are created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Again, in my Bible, I have this highlighted in red because this is our responsibility. This is what God wants us to do with this information. When you read the Bible, you should ask, is this something that I should think about differently? Maybe I've been thinking about salvation in the wrong way. Maybe I've been thinking I'm working my way into heaven. And God is saying, I want you to re-understand um, that, revisit that so that you can understand it properly so that you're not working your way into heaven, but heaven is a good gift from God. 
Is it something that he wants us to do different? He wants us to understand that we are created for good works. God created us like a workmanship. If you ever go and look at um, beautiful art or you look at a beautiful sculpture or some some kind of art, that it's, it's a workmanship. Someone put time to make it look beautiful. And God is saying that you are my beautiful creation. I created you. Why did you create us? For good works. That And we should walk in them. So we are created for good works. Again, when we do good works, it's not because we're trying to work our way into heaven, but it's a sign that we are saved. We don't do good works to be saved, but because we are saved, we do good works. And he says, and you should walk in them. These gifts are for us, and we should walk in them. We should be doing good works. We should be walking this out, because this is what we're created to do. We should be telling people about Jesus. Not just pastors, not just missionaries. Every one of us, because every one of us is God's workmanship, because every one of us is created for good works. Not just me, not just the few people, everyone that's hearing me is created for good works. Everyone hearing me is is called to be blameless and holy. Everyone is, this is our, this is what God created us for. You may be a rapper, you may be a uh, educational coach, you may be a counselor, you may be a professor, you may be um, whatever it is, a janitor. And that's what you do, but that's not who you are. You are a child of God. And that may be what you do, but your purpose is to reflect God's glory. Your purpose is in your job, in your career, in your family to show the world what God looks like. To do good works. That's what it means to do good works. We we tell people about Jesus. But we also show people who Jesus is. Um, I forget exactly who it was. But he said. Um, Preach the gospel everywhere. And if necessary use words. That's interesting. If necessary use words. He wants you to preach the gospel everywhere. How do you preach the gospel without using words? It's with our life. He wants you to live out what you're preaching he wants you to show what what it really means to be a christian what it really means to be a disciple Uh, verse 11 therefore remember that at one time you gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands remember that you were at a time separate from christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Again, Paul is reminding them. And really, he's reminding us because most of us are not Jews by birth. Most of us were not born into a Jewish family. If you were not born into a Jewish family and your lineage points back to the Jews, Abraham, even as far as uh, Adam, then you're not a Jew. You're a Gentile. I'm a Gentile. All of us are Gentiles. And that just means people who are not Jews by birth. So he's reminding them, don't get too cocky. I know what's going on with the Jewish people. I know that they're falling away from God. I know that they had Jesus crucified. I know that. And understand that even though they did that, that was part of God's plan. It was all part of God's plan. It may seem like, Uh, Oh, those mean old Jews killed Jesus. That was part of God's plan. And so, one, he wants them to change their perspective and he wants to make sure that they don't become too prideful. They don't become too prideful and say, look at y'all sinful people. Look at how good I am. I'm living for God. I'm seated in the heavenly places. I got everything going on. Um, And we look down on non-Christians. But instead he's saying, no, you were one of them. You didn't deserve it. God didn't call you just because you're smart, you're educated, because you read, because you you know this information, you have these talents, you have these gifts. That's not why God called you. That's not why God called me. That's not why God called me because I can rap. He didn't call me because um, I was better looking than anybody. That's not why God calls us. He doesn't call us because of that, because he doesn't need any of that. That stuff doesn't matter to him. That might matter to the world, but that's not what's important to him. He wants our heart. A heart that says, God, I'm open. 
I may not know all the information. I may be scared to tell my friends. I may be scared to tell my family. I may not know how to do it. I may not have all the information and the scriptures memorized. But I'm open and I'm willing and I want to say yes. When you call me, I want to say yes. So Paul is reminding them. Remember at a time you were, um, you were far from him. You were alienated. You were separated. You had no promise. You didn't have any of these promises of hope. And you were in the world. In verse 13, again, look for, <laughs> sounds funny, but look for the big buts in the Bible. The big buts. But God. But God. Verse 13. But now you were separated from Christ. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Not by your works but by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, is our peace. He's the Prince of Peace and he is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And so I think this is a, a good place to stop. This is verse 14. I'm going to bring this back because this is a whole... Almost a whole nother topic of what Paul's going to start talking about. But he wants us to hear what he's saying. Before we were separate. Before it was Jews and Gentiles. Before us Gentiles who were not Jews by birth. We were separate from God. We didn't have no promises. The only way we would get the promises is if we became Jews. Now it's different because Jesus came and he broke down the dividing wall. Before we had no hope. Our only hope was, hopefully I can work my way into heaven. And that's not true. Because we can't work our way into heaven. We're not good, good enough and we'll never be good enough. So instead, God came. Instead, Jesus came. Instead, the Holy Spirit came. And now we are able to have them in our lives. We are able to be seated in the heaven, heavenly places. We are able to... Um, do good works because that's what he created us for. We are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece. That's another way to say it. We are God's masterpiece, well crafted, well taken care of, thought out. We may look at our bodies and say, well, I'm not skinny like this person. I don't have the body like this person. I'm not tall like this person. I don't have the eyes of this person. I don't have this of this person. And God is saying, you are my masterpiece. You are my masterpiece. I created you. I want you to take care of your temple. I want you to take care of your body. I want you to do what you can to um to to have a healthy body and eat right. But you are my masterpiece. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you have called us your masterpiece. We thank you that you have called us your workmanship. We thank you that you have called us holy. We thank you that you have set us apart to be holy, to do your will. Father, and I pray, Lord, that everyone listening will walk into that. And we don't look at ourselves in the negative way that we used to. We don't look at ourselves in the negative way that other people say things about us. But instead, we will see, this is who God called me. I am God's masterpiece. I am God's creation. He loves me. I'm adopted. I'm seated in the heavenly places. His truth is, is my truth. What he says about me is true. Let God be the truth and every man a lie. Father, we thank you. We, we give you all the honor and glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.